prayer. Father God, I just thank you for today. Father, I thank you for this time we can come together, God. I thank you for all the beautiful people here today, God, and that we are here for this word, and we are here for such a time as this. Father, I pray that we have good soil, God, that you would till that ground, Lord, that we would have ears to hear the word that you have for us today, Lord, and we just give you all praise, all glory, all honor, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So we are continuing on to 2 Samuel. Amen. Amen. That's, all right. So I'm going to read all of 2 Samuel chapter 1. It's a little bit lengthy, but bear with me. Continuing, this is a report of Saul's death. It says, Now it came to pass after the death of Saul when David had returned from the slaughter of the Malachites and David had stayed two days in Ziklag. On the third day, behold, it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. So it was when he came to David that he fell to the ground and prostrated himself. David said, where have you come from? And he said, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, how did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, the people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. So David said to the young man who told him, how do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? And the young man who told him said, I happened by chance to be on Mount Gilboa. And there was Saul leaning on a spear. Indeed, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. Now when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me, and I answered, Here I am. And he said, Who are you? So I answered, I am an Amalekite. And he said to me again, Please stand over me and kill me, for anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him, and I killed him, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, and had brought them here to my Lord. Therefore David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, for the people of the Lord and the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. And David said to the young man who told him, Where are you from? And he answered, I am the son of an alien, an Amalekite. And so David said, How was it that you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Probably not what he was expecting. <laughs> And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and execute him. And he struck him so that he died. So David said to him, Your blood is on your own head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. And so David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. And he told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew nor rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For the shield of the mighty is cast away there, the shield of Saul not anointed with oil, from the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty. The bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. I have, you have been very pleasant to me, and you, your love to me was wonderful. How uh, surpassing the love of women how the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. So what's going on here? David finds out um, that Saul and Jonathan have died, right? And <clears throat> this Amalekite comes to him and says, J Jonathan has died, Saul has died, that he, was, he witnessed it and he was actually the one that killed Saul. And so David and his men, they mourn for Saul, they mourn for his best friend, Jonathan, and then he writes a, a, a psalm of lament for him. Now, if you were here last week, we know this is not a true account of how Saul died. The Bible records in the last chapter of 1 Samuel that Saul killed himself, and when his armor bearer saw that he was dead, his armor bearer killed himself. Because the armor bearer wouldn't have died unless Saul was dead. Well, so we, we have an account of it. So we know this guy is lying for what reason we don't really know. My speculation is he probably wanted to gain favor 
from the next king of Israel. He comes and he gives him his crown and his bracelets from Saul. And he's thinking, David's going to reward me for this. The next king, David, will reward me for this. Well, David's kind of a little bit curious here because he gets intent on the man's story and his tone changes in verse 13. And he changes to a more, it becomes a more judicial line of questioning. Okay? When he says, who are you? It's a more a judicial line of questioning here. And the young man continues to stick to his story and tell David that he killed Saul. And so I'm like, dude, that's your story? Like David staked his whole life on touch not God's anointed. Because of his allegiance to the Lord and his allegiance to the king. And David was in many years of affliction. He was in many years of persecution. He was in many years of pain. And this Amalekite thinks he's going to win favor with David by killing the man that David defended. The one that David defended even to the point of his own detriment. Yes. Yes. That would be like going to Pastor Jay and speaking bad about Pastor Matt to him yeah. to win favor with Pastor Jay. Yeah. It ain't happening. You ain't turning Jay's ear. No. He knows my husband too well. He's like, I ain't doing that. What kind of delusion is this guy living under? David swore his allegiance to God and to God's anointed. And so it begs the question in our own life, to whom are you pledging allegiance? Because allegiance is defined as a loyalty or a commitment of a subordinate to a superior or of an individual to a group or cause. And David was loyal to God and to God's man for the job. And that is a very rare thing these days. And it's important to declare one's allegiance, right? We, we do it. I mean, at least we did when we were kids. I pledge allegiance yeah. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, invisible with liberty and justice for all. Ooh. Right? We used, to, we used to say that when we were kids, right? And, but the U.S. is not needy in making its citizens say a pledge. We got nuclear bombs. Yeah. They're not needy, Right? But it reveals an allegiance. Whether or not we stand for the flag makes no difference to who America is. It doesn't change America if you don't stand. But it reveals an allegiance. Where's where's your allegiance? It doesn't change America. It just reveals something in us. And the ancient understanding of faith demanded an issue of a response. The Greek word pistos, or, or pisto, right, was the, is the word believe, you know. Um, it's in John 3.16, it's also in John 3.36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So it meant to that you had a belief was a loyalty or an allegiance, a commitment to something. That if you believed in Christ, you were loyal to and committed to Christ. Faith is loyal. Right? Something in today's thing that some people might uh, acknowledge is our marriage vows are linked with allegiance. You do not flippantly enter into marriage vows. There's an allegiance there. And Christianity in America has become a flippant declaration at the altar. We're forgetting that we actually made a vow to God. Just like you cannot say, I'm loyal to America and collude with other nations. Can't say I am loyal to Jesus and collude with the world. We've been given a great gift in the atoning blood of Jesus. He was a better sacrifice and gave us a greater covenant with greater promises. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. See, a gift given requires a response. Yeah. Last, last week, I, um, 
I had a biopsy done on my leg. I had a second biopsy done on my leg, so I got a three-inch gas right here. I had to have eight stitches, and it's been, it's been, it's been healing. I got a cold, you know. I still am fighting a cold, I, you know. And, and I'm just like, you know, you just fight through these things. It is what it is. But I came home, and my husband had bought me this huge bouquet of flowers. Like it was huge. It's like the biggest thing I ever saw. I was like, oh my gosh, what, what the heck? It's like I just know you had a bad week. I mean, I was so excited. It's like, Lord, I, oh, honey, thank you so much. Those are so beautiful. Oh my gosh, I love you. I love you. I love you. They're flowers. <laughs> but see, my response to his gift was because of my allegiance to him. Yes. The res- my response to a gift demonstrates the magnitude of my allegiance. Yes. You can always tell when someone doesn't like you when you give them a gift, how they respond. They're like, oh, thanks. Great. Today we're going to talk about allegiance. Aren't you glad you guys are here? Yes. Yes. This is good. Amen. Thank you. All right. We're talking about four elements of allegiance. The first one is faithful. Allegiance is faithful. It's a faithful until the end. David was faithful to Saul as long as Saul lived. As long as Saul lived. And even though David had been anointed king, he would let God sort out the details. He would not usurp God's authority. He wasn't going to usurp authority. He refused. And God has been faithful to us, and what he has done for us, he requires of us. When my husband and I got married at the altar and he promised to be faithful to me, you better make sure he was, he was like, you better be faithful to me. Yeah. Right. What, what he was willing to do, he required of me as well. Yeah. What he was willing to do, he requires of me as well. Yeah. And faithful means loyal, constant, steadfast. And show me your calendar and your bank statement and I'll show you where you're faithful to. Because people say they are committed to the Lord, but their actions prove they are committed to something different. We show by our actions we're committed to our job, we're committed to ourselves, we're committed to having fun, we're committed to a football game, we're committed to kids' sports, we're committed to living a nice, comfortable life. We show what we're committed to. Paul was faithful to Jesus. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And I always like to use Paul as an example because people always say, well, you know, Jesus was the son of God, you know, and, and he could do it all because, you know, I'm like, well, the same spirit that dwells in me dwelled in Christ. But what about Paul? Yeah. Yeah. What's your excuse for Paul? Yeah. <laughs> he did it. Yeah. By the same spirit. And the indictment to the church in Laodicea was that they were lukewarm. But see, lukewarm is a symptom of a deeper issue. It's a symptom of something deeper that's going on. It's found in verse 17 of Revelation 3. Jesus said, you say, because you say. Now in the Greek, this is really emphasized, really big. It means you say. He's really pointing it out. He's, He's saying, you say you have gotten your own stuff. You have done your own thing. You have done it your way. And so you are lukewarm. That's what he's saying. They judge what was good, right, and true. And their allegiance was to themselves. And the Lord had to tell them they were lukewarm. Yes. And faithfulness requires humility. Man, that was a theme this weekend, right, ladies? We talked about humiliation a lot. Pride has no place in the house of God, has no place in the Christian. Amen. It's in humiliation is where I find my worth. Amen. To gain life, I must die to myself. Yes. And it's an abdication of my kingdom, my throne, my self-interest, and anything that I think I have my own right to. Amen. It's humiliation. Tozer said this, and listen up, this makes me cry every time I read it. He said, what can be more depressing than to find a professed Christian defending his supposed rights and bitterly resisting any attempt to violate them? Such a Christian has never accepted the way of the cross. The sweet graces of meekness and humility are unknown to that person. Every day, they grow harder and more acrimonious trying to defend their reputation, right, and ministry against imagined foes. 
Billy Graham preached a sermon from the 60s called The Offense of the Cross. You know, uh, uh, I think Marcus and Gallio were like the ones that shared it. And, and I, I must have listened that time. I can't tell you how many times I've listened to that. You know, and, and the whole thing was, Billy Graham said, is that the man that's truly come to the cross has seen himself clearly for who he really is and wants that to die in him yes. and to be made new in Christ. So if a man is not generous, has he really been to the cross? If he still operates in greed, if he still is divisive, if he still wants his way, has that man truly been to the cross? If a man harbors unforgiveness, if a man harbors an offense, and a man harbors any alleged right that he has to himself, has he truly been to the cross? If a man truly does not love others, has he really been to the cross? Because the Bible says to prefer others better than myself. Faithfulness is also pure. Jesus' primary consideration is my absolute annihilation of my right to myself and my identification with him. So it's not just giving up myself and, and my rights. Now it's to identify with him. Yes, amen. He doesn't say, just be nothing. He says, be in me. Yeah, that's good. Be nothing here, but be in me here. Identify fully which, with him, which is, means having a relationship with him, which there's no other relationships. It's me and him. And does your life display words and actions that are faithful to Christ? Or is it a life that's mixed with the world? Because that's his spiritual adultery. And James says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so I ask you, friend, if someone looked at your Facebook from afar, what would they gather about you? Because now we're all over social media, right? If someone looked from the outside looking in, like what would they say that your life looks like? What would they say that you had an allegiance to? Yeah. The second thing of, about allegiance is obedience. See, God commands certain practices is he determines allegiance. God determines what it is. And so he gets to say what we do. In 2 Peter, um, or I'm sorry, uh, 2 Samuel, in the first verse, we'll get to this next week, but it says, it happened after this that David inquired of the Lord. So notice that he, he as soon as he was done, he asked of the Lord, Lord, because I want to obey you, what do I do next? Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said, go up. And David said, where shall I go up? And he said, to he Hebron. And then Hebron was a, a, a priestly city. But you know what I love about David's heart is that David had a heart for people. Because he said, what do I do now? What city do I go to? Because the, these, the, the, there's lost sheep here. How do, I, how do I now become a king that gathers the people to me? That gathers the people to God? How do I do that? And did you know that God ordained the corporate gathering of worship? The average American Christian attends church 1.6 times a month. And then they only stay at a church for seven years. That's the average. The average family stays at a church for seven years. You know, and, and when you relate this to marriage, there's a certain marriage statistic that said at seven years, people get what? The itch. There's a seven-year itch. Why? Because they start like, oh, are we, are, we, are we still committed? I don't know. I don't really like them. I don't know. Should I be in this marriage? What does this look like? I don't want this anymore. I'm itching. I got to get out. Right? Well, marriage is, we're, we're in a marriage with him. We're in a, mar we're in a marriage with each other. Right. We're in a marriage with each other. Folks, America has an allegiance problem. Yeah. Yeah. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, And let us, not con let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the matter of some. He said some do. He said, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. What day? The end day. And it's approaching fast. If you haven't noticed, if you're paying any discerning, discerning mind, paying any kind of attention to what's going on in the world, the Lord said, so much more so be in the house of God. Amen. Not so much the less. He said, so much more. Yes. And all the women can attest that every word of prophecy that came this weekend was urgent. 
It was a word of urgency. It was, you better do it now. You better get right now. There's a short window that's open now. Now is the day. Now is the time. You now. There's an urgency. There's certain lies in the church. It's all about me. What's in it for me? Or even I can do it alone. And these are all, fal- uh, these are all false. Because either all went into the promised land or none went in. My, it, my destiny, your destiny is hinged on the one sitting next to you. It is. God has a purpose in our assembly. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-five: 25, my praise shall be of you in the great assembly. Oh, where's that? In here. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. Where will I pay my vows? Here. In the great assembly. Let me ask you this. Why do they gather in China and people risk their life to go to church if we can worship at home? People, people die to go to church in China. Yes. We, we have a friend that left everything here to go be a missionary in China. And he, for six years, he learned their language because he wanted to reach the people. They have underground churches and people are dying to go to church. And here, people would die, would rather die than go to church. The Bible says faith without works, a corresponding action, your work is a corresponding action to faith, is dead. It means faith requires a response. Yes. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Listen to that. If your faith doesn't have a response, it's dead. Pay attention, folks. And some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Yes. You believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Do you know even the demons believe in Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But do you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without a corresponding action is dead. Yes. Yeah. The greatest thing that came out of the Reformation was an allegiance to the authority of scriptures. And allegiance requires obedience. It requires obedience in the tithe. I'm not going to argue with anybody about this. Matthew 6.21 just says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Yeah. First Chronicles 29.16, O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and all is your own. Yeah. So he says... So really, he says, everything that you have brought me, don't get so haughty about it. It was mine to begin with. (laughs) Tithing has to do with an allegiance. It's an allegiance problem. Baptism, allegiance. Where's your commitment? Where's your loyalty? Where's your obedience? Communion. Communion time's not a snack. It's a renewing of our commitment to God and to one another. Yes. Communion is not just between you and God. It's, verti- it's vertical and horizontal. Yeah. And I firmly believe what the Bible says, that some have died and are sick because they are taking communion in an unworthy manner. Yeah. I believe it because God said it. Obedience to your leaders. Ooh. David would not touch Saul. Why? Because God raised up Saul. David believed God had raised up Saul. Yeah. David trusted God. And so David submitted to Saul. Yes. Yeah. And God is a God of order and authority. Yeah. It's all over the Bible. Yeah. Hebrews thirteen seventeen: Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Nobody likes to submit. Right. Nobody. I, I don't like it, but there's freedom in submission. Yes. Man, it's freedom. Woo, bow the knee, man. It feels good. Yeah. For they watch out for your souls as though who must give an account. Pastor Matt is going to give an account for your soul. Right. And let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for who? You. And Pastor Matt's not here today. It was an honor for him to go preach at Pastor Ong's church. So he asked me at the last minute to preach this. And so I get to brag on him a little bit. And Pastor Matt, my husband, is not a self-appointed pastor. 
He didn't appoint. Listen to me. If you want to be a pastor, you're crazy. You got to. You better be called. Yes. Right. You better be called, because this work is not for the faint of heart. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. It is hard. And I've watched my husband come under attack time and time and time again. And listen, you can say anything you want about me. I can take it. But you talk about my beloved. Ooh, you're getting the wrath of Crystal. <laughs> I just had to throw that in. That's a little fleshly, but it's okay. <laughs> but, but, you know... Uh, we've been doing ministry six, for 16 years, and, and, and listen, and we love people. We love them. And we have watched people use the church and use people for their own means. We've watched them get mad. We've watched them tear things down. They've teared us down, and year after year, and I've watched my husband say, we're going to forgive him. We're going to keep moving on, Crystal. We're going to forgive him. We're going to keep moving on. We're going to forgive him. We're going to keep moving on. We're going to forgive him. We're going to love him. We're going to keep moving on. We're going to forgive. We're going to forgive your love, and we're going to press on. Why? Because that's what we're called to do. And that's my husband. Anybody that knows him knows that about him. Yep. He has forgiven more people. I'm like, got him off. <laughs> off with their head. <laughs> See, you, should, you guys should be glad I'm not the senior pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we will never flourish if we're not planted. Those that are planted, 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 planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. We have to be planted in God's house. And the third part of allegiance is honor. Respect and reverence punctuates my allegiance. Right? And we see here, David showed honor to Saul, to somebody that didn't even deserve it. Somebody that tried to kill him. Somebody that was hateful, that was operating with a demonic spirit. David honored him. He honored him. And there's a culture of sloppiness in America. Casual Christianity and atmosphere of tardiness. I'm getting hot up here. I'm sweating. Why? Because we've lost the awe of God. We've lost the awe of of God because we've become too familiar with God. There's this dichotomy with God, right? Where God is, is great and he's powerful and he's almighty and he's holy. Yes. And at the same time, he's our friend and our close confidant. Yes. And we can dwell in his presence. Yes, but what happens is that familiarity breeds contempt. Yes. That means an extensive knowledge or a close association with someone or something leads to a loss of respect for them, folks. And we lost respect for God. Do you understand why David wouldn't touch Saul? Because he feared God. So I'm not going to touch God's anointed. I fear God. I have an awe of God. The transgression of the wicked says in their heart, there's no fear of God. If you had a fear of God, we wouldn't do half the things we do. We wouldn't say half the things we say. We must understand the fear of the Lord. There's a casualness in his closeness, but the only reason I'm alive is because his blood and his grace. It's the only reason I'm alive. It's the only reason I can stand here because God's grace and the blood of Christ has washed me clean and he drew me to himself. I should honor him. See, some things changed at the cross, but some have not. And what the cross was meant to change, it changed. But what the cross was not meant to change, did not change. And we certainly did not change God at the cross. Yeah, that's good. Jesus is not a PR person trying to give the Old Testament God a good name. Yeah. There's important Old Testament principles that still apply. Leviticus 10, it talks about a strange or unauthorized fire that was used for the offering. And Aaron's sons used unauthorized fire because they didn't fear God. They didn't fear God. And we see that actually in the New Testament, right? You ever heard of Ananias and Sapphira? Because God is holy. Yes. It's because he's holy. 
And there's a lot of familiarity in our church and familiarity closes the gate to God's power. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. He's writing that to the church. He's not writing it to somebody out there. He says, church, let him who thinks he stand, you better watch it. Take heed lest you fall. Yes. Yeah. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. See, worship is holy. Are we flippant with our words and with our worship? Worship's holy. You know, Amanda takes great pains to go through and she pours through songs to find songs that are vertical. Yes, amen. That praise God, right? Worship is not about me. Yes. It's not written for me. It's not about me. I don't care. Listen, it's not about you. I don't care if you don't like the song. I don't care if you don't like the tune. I don't care if you don't like how it sounds. I don't even care if you don't like Amanda. <laughs> Worship's not about you. It's about God. I like Amanda. <laughs> Do you walk into church late? Where's the respect for God? Do you know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? How are you treating other people? Yes, yes. If I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, then that means I'm holy. That means Shelly's holy. How am I treating Shelly? She's a temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And people too familiar with the Holy Spirit grow into disrespect for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is sacred. The blood of Christ is sacred. Amen. Preaching is holy. I get a knot before I preach. Why? Not because I'm afraid of you guys, because I fear him. Yes. Because I want to say the words that I'm saying are his words, not my words. Yes. Even after I, after I preach, I asked Pastor Kevin, I said, well, was there anything fleshly in that or was it of God? And he said, no, you're good, sister. I said, praise God. I don't want, I don't want me to come through. Yes. Prophesying is holy you better watch what you say in God's name. Oh, yeah. Better watch what you say. God told me. You better watch what you say. These things are holy. Yes. These are sacred. Stop being flippant with how you handle God's word. It's holy. And the last part is integrity. Integrity means my allegiance, my allegiance, allegiance. <laughs> my allegiance is firm. I walk it out 24-7. So integrity is the manner then in which I walk out my allegiance, being honorable in the way and manner in which we do things. And allegiance is at the heart of what I do and who I am. Right? Integrity means that you keep your word. Keep your commitments. Take responsibility. Stop blaming others. Consider others better than yourself. Walk in humility. First Peter 2.17 says, Honor all people. Oh, that's interesting. All people. Not some, not most, not the ones you like. All. all. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. That, that's agape. It's not when you feel like it or how you feel about things. My feelings don't matter. Amen. Love is a choice. It's a purpose to say, I'm going to love you even though I don't like what you're doing like right now. I may not even like your personality right now, but I'm going to love you. Amen. Amen. Love the brotherhood. That's those in Christ. Love us. You have to love me. You don't like this message? Love me anyways. Amen. I had to walk this out. Good. Fear God. There it is. It's a fear God. Keep in awe and reverence of God. Yes. He is to be honored. He is to be feared. And honor the king. And folks, our allegiance to God is being challenged here in America. Make no mistake, it is being challenged in America, and it is going to come knocking on your door. And if you don't settle this, you won't stand. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Angie, will you come and play? Today, what I want to do, first of all, there's, there's three things I want to do. I want to offer uh, a time for those that don't know Christ. I want to offer you a time to get prayed for, to come to know the Lord. The Bible says if you would repent and turn from your sins, there's no good work you can do. There's nothing good you can do. You cannot earn your way to heaven. There's no righteousness in you. There is no goodness in us. It is only because of him. And he says if you will turn from your ways and you will turn towards him and run towards him, run towards the cross, say, Father, forgive me, and he will cleanse you by the blood of the Lamb. And he will make you a new creation. And today can be your salvation story. Today can be the start of your story. And you don't know Christ, just give me an opportunity for someone to come and pray with you. Um, just raise your hand. If you, don't know, if you don't know the Lord, raise your hand. Someone wants to pray with you today. The second thing I, I want to say is, if you've been far from the Lord You've been a prodigal. You've been living in the slop. Today's the day that you come to your senses. Come to your senses and say, I cannot do this without you, Lord. You know the truth. You've just been far from him. There's a story of the man that was possessed. And it says, when he saw Jesus, he ran to him. You need to run to Jesus. You need to run to Jesus and he's waiting with open arms. If you want someone to pray with you, raise your hand. We'll have someone pray with you. And the third thing, sir, will you, would you like to come up front and we'll have someone pray with you? I need a, I need a man. Marcus, do you want to come? Can someone come pray with this man? Oh, he's in there. Thank you. Marcus is going to pray for you. And the third thing I want to do because it's been so heavy on my heart. Folks, we need to renew our allegiance to Christ and renew our vow to Christ. And I'm just going to, I'm going to get on my knees. And if you want to do this with me, just lift up your hands. Tell the Lord you want to renew your commitment to him and that your allegiance is to him and him alone and nothing else matters. Nothing else matters but to know him, to know his ways, to be full of the Holy Spirit. My life doesn't matter. My life is yours, God. My heart is yours. My mind is yours. Father, I have nothing but this broken vessel, God. Take it and use it for your good pleasure. Just renew your vow to him today. Just take a minute. Take a minute. Just take a minute. And renew your commitment to him and your vow. All I am is yours, Lord. All I am is yours, Lord. Hallelujah. Let the words today sink into your, into your heart. And guard your heart, folks. And protect the seed. This the, this the, the enemy comes immediately. Don't let him steal that place where God planted a word in you. Remember what he's done. Remember how good he is. And the great sacrifice of the cross. Always keep the cross in front of you. Always look to the cross. Don't never forget the cross and the great sacrifice that was paid so that you could come into contact with a holy, wonderful, loving, mighty God. And we thank you, Lord, and praise you, Father. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name.